You're listening to The Artist Athlete, episode 51. This podcast is dedicated to circus. It's a place for professionals in the industry to share their stories, viewpoints, and information, and a place for outsiders to get a sneak peek into this world. Hey, friends, fans, and enemies. I'm Shannon McKenna. I'm the host of the Artist Athlete Podcast and the founder of theartistathlete.com. I want to give a special shout out today to someone I've shouted out before on this podcast. It's Derek. He's my sound editor. He's really mad at me right now because I'm recording this on Saturday morning and the podcast will go out on Sunday. So thank you, Derek, for your patience. And also thank you so much for all your hard work on this show. When I first started, I just picked up a microphone and started calling my friends and I knew that I didn't want to learn anything about how to edit the sound, how to put in cool epic music, how to release it across all these platforms, how to take out background noise, which there is a little bit of in this episode because I recorded it just like in the kitchen of my house. This is a super bare bones production and Derek has been instrumental in making it sound as professional as it does. I pay Derek, I don't get paid myself, but I do pay Derek through the awesome contributions of Patreons. So they're my other love, my other shout out, the other reason this podcast is going and sounding so good over 51 episodes. They are giving small amounts of money each month to help me keep the podcast up and running. And if you want to become one of them, please do. You can go to patreon.com slash theartistathlete and give a monthly donation. You can give as little as a dollar. Uh, again, that's patreon.com slash theartistathlete. Sign up, become a Patreon today. My guest today is Tanya Burka. Tanya went from being a too tall gymnast to performing one of the most iconic silks numbers in one of the most iconic Cirque du Soleil shows, Kidam. She's an aerialist. She now works as part of the creative team for the circus company Short Round Productions, who is touring Germany with their show Filament at the moment. She is also a educator and an amazing advocate online and in person for a lot of issues that are going on in the circus community right now. This episode is filled with amazing insights from how to break down difficult skills to how to work with people who may not have the quote unquote standard body type for circus. She talks about the impact social media has on standards of professionalism and ownership over choreography. She talks about how to get work in the industry. Tanya shared so much wisdom and insight in this interview. It was a pleasure to have her on. Here's my interview with Tanya Burka. Tanya Burka. I say your name. Yeah. Welcome. Hi. Hey. <laughs> so can you say who you are and what you do? Sure. That's a... I never know how to encapsulate that. I am a circus performer slash teacher slash artistic coordinator and manager of projects at this point. I yeah. It's yeah. so it's so weird. I've been I've been around in the industry for so long that now I'm like, yes, I do the thing. I know, right? That's why I always ask people like to explain what they do themselves, because like what you know that old internet meme that's like what people think I do, what mm -hmm. my parents think I do, what I actually do yeah. are like always really different. Yeah. So I was like, you, why don't you tell me what you think you do? Yeah. People think I do a lot of things, but really I just send emails. Yeah. Now I'm, I'm just, I'm at that point now where I, I feel like I'm wearing so many different hats that I'm starting to resemble a hedgehog. <laughs> <laughs> That's adorable. How did you get your start? Let's start at the start. You were a gymnast. Yes, yes, I was among the world's least naturally talented artistic gymnasts. Started when I was about nine years old and was already taller than the girls on the competitive team. Oh, God. <laughs> yeah. So I was lucky. I, I, you know, grew up in a family of all Ukrainians. It was my grandparents that immigrated during the Second World War. 
So they were like, cool, like you're, you're going to go and become a doctor or an astronaut or a lawyer or something, but like you can do what you want in your free time. And my friends were doing gymnastics. So I started doing gymnastics and it turned out I really liked it and stuck with it longer than all my friends did. That said, I, I was a giant. Um, <laughs> and so I wasn't particularly amazing at it. And again, very lucky. I had a very supportive gym that didn't care that I wasn't really the right proportions for it and that were happy to keep training me so long as I was doing it the right way. They had a very nice discussion with me. I think it was probably really formative for, for my circus career as well when I was starting to finally learn how to do flips where they just pulled me aside and were like, okay, cool. So here's where we get to have a chat with you. Most of the girls who are learning to do backflips are six years old. And if they bail out halfway through, we grab them out of the air, put them back down on the floor, yell at them, and then make them go sit on a bench for five minutes before they come back to class. And we can't do that with you, for you are taller than we are. And if you change your mind halfway through a skill, there's absolutely no way that we can save it. Like, you'll get hurt, we'll probably get hurt. So what we're going to do with you, like, we'll give you all the drills you need, We'll tell you when you think you're ready to do something and you come back to us and you tell us when you think you're ready to do it because that's actually more important. Like watch everyone you can try and understand the technique because if you're not doing it right at your size, you're just not making it around. And then just be, be sure that when you're going to do something that you're actually ready to commit to it. Yeah, which I was great advice and I carried it all the way forward. But so that was, that was what I did growing up. There were, you know, that was the option if you wanted to do flips. That's um, so interesting. So I, I tried circus for the first time. My high school had a weird program where in senior year they kicked you out for the last month and said, go somewhere, do something, be nominally supervised, but the teachers don't want to deal with you anymore. And then you come back and graduate. So I thought I was going to go off and become an engineer at this point. So I, I went and volunteered at uh, what was then the San Francisco School for Circus Arts, what is now the, the Circus Center, and basically was their pet slave for a month, fixing the copy machine, reorganizing their filing system, going and handing out brochures and whatever, sweeping in exchange for taking some classes. So right before I left, a few of the teachers were like, hey, by the way, like, there's like some schools where you can go to, to do this, like to, to train professionally to be a performing artist. And like, you're going off to work for NASA, but we just thought we should mention like, you could probably do it if you wanted to, like you could probably get into one of those schools. And I thought long and hard about that and thought my parents will murder me and bury the body where no one can find it if I tell them, <laughs> by the way, I'm, I'm not going off to university, I'm going to run away and join the circus. And I'd only done it for a month. So I thought, okay, you know what, that's, that's a great idea to keep in mind. Let's go and get my degree. And if it's really important to me afterwards, I'll know. And the idea just, it really, it did stick with me. So by the time that I was writing my senior thesis, I was also auditioning for the National Circus School. I had a few other backups in mind, but my, my idea was if I don't get into one of the schools that I, I think would be good for me within a year, I'm giving up because I'm already 22 and I'm not a performer. So I definitely need to learn how to be on a stage. And if it doesn't happen in a year, I, I don't think that it's going to happen for me in this time period. Yeah. Yeah. So I was lucky. The circus school took me, the one in Montreal, three years there. At 22? Yeah. Is that more rare now to be taken that Yeah. I mean, I, I don't think it's even necessarily a question of discrimination, age discrimination. I think there are so many more places where people have access to train circus recreationally or at a pre-professional level now. And they know that that's what they want to do younger. Mm. So they can come in ready for what the school can give them in three years time at a younger age. And realistically speaking, you know, for career longevity, it makes sense for them to prioritize people who are going in at that age. It varies by discipline, of course. So there were quite a number of us in, in my year that were at that age level that had already either gone to university or auditioned for school a few times. I, I think it was just a product of the times. So you said your teachers pulled you aside and they said, listen, these are the risks or these are the benefits. This is what you need to do in order to execute these skills. Have you ever done that in your own teaching? No. What I find is like gymnastics is 
again, it's very specialized. It's not meant for tall people. That There's a very good reason why they had that chat with me specifically, and it's because there's hands-on spotting at the level where you can damage your coach if you don't do stuff right at my size. Sure. What I do do is talk to people about the realities of their body type in training. There are certain skills where if your torso to leg proportion is is really different from most people's, you're going to struggle more. Or like if you are a bigger aerialist, yeah, like some things are going to be harder. It doesn't mean you can't do things, but is your timeline going to look different? Is your progression going to look different? Might I give you different drills than I'm giving most of the students? Absolutely. Like, or people with like a Eller Danlos syndrome, mm -hmm. like, oh my God, they have to, they have to be careful with their bodies and look at things differently than the way most people do because their body just doesn't respond the same way. So I, I, I do think it's made me conscious that like, especially with circus, it's, it, you can't just cookie cutter. You can't take the same approach with everyone. So you went to the National Circus School and did you select to do tissue or did? I selected to do tissue. My coach specifically asked me to do something else after my first year, something that she thought I wouldn't be able to just learn somewhere else. Mm. So I wound up switching to a swinging discipline, which was swinging hoop, picked completely randomly because... I didn't know what to do, and I didn't really know a lot about the circus industry because American. So I did a swinging discipline for two years, and then by the time I graduated and we were having career management class, was like, wait a minute, I'm going to need a crane bar for this, and I would always need to have a longer. Uh, what is yep. that in English? Uh, someone pulling the safety lines. I don't know. what. I think longer is yeah. like the same. And like, right? yeah. And there's, you know, so few jobs out there for swinging disciplines and you have to be really, really committed and obsessed to doing this. And I'm like, and I just, I just want to work. <laughs> what am I doing? So I, I graduated doing swinging hoop, but I always almost forget that. immediately switched back to to doing primarily aerial silks and aerial hoop. I, I mean, I think I learned a lot from doing a swinging discipline because there's so much precision and timing that goes into that. But no, I just wanted to work, and that's that's not the discipline to go into for that. So yeah. I'm always amazed at swinging. I think swinging trapeze is probably, or any kind of swinging discipline, yeah. I'm always amazed by those people. Yeah. Because I, of the commitment and the returns on. Yeah, it's, I mean, mad respect. You know, I did it for yeah. two years. I know it's hard, but it's it's a whole other level of, like, you have to want it so badly. And like I said, you know, I was just like, oh, pick something else. Oh that <laughs> um so yeah so in the end I, I didn't I didn't have that attachment to it that you really need to drive your career yeah sure so what was your first contract out of school I did some like corporate stuff in and around Montreal for a little while but I I was actually leaving because my student visa was expiring so my first long-term contract coming out of circus school was with uh, pendulum aerial arts in Portland Oregon Nice. Yeah. It was really great for me. It was a lot more teaching than performing because the economic crisis hitting right around the same time. But it gave me the opportunity to focus back on, on doing single point stuff to getting back in aerial silks and developing my own vocabulary. And, and you learn a lot by teaching. There were some really amazing young student performers there. So time very, very well spent. Cool. And then when did Kidam come around? That was 2011. So I'd already been working for a while. I was on tour with Wonderbolt Circus in Newfoundland when they called me. They were looking for like an emergency replacement because the current artist was out on injury and their backup was also out on injury. So they called and needed to know if I would be available like the next week. And luckily I was. Wow. Yeah. Nice. Yeah, it was super amazing. I, I went in to IHQ and then even more amazingly, the, the coach at the time was like, um, do you, do you know the act? And I was like, I mean, kind of, sort of, like I've obviously seen videos. This was, uh, it was Isabel Vaudel, the actual original at the time who was doing it. Mm -hmm. And so I said, you know, I, I know her skills. They're not necessarily ones that I would perform on a regular basis, but I can definitely do them. And she just goes, well, would you rather propose your own choreography? I was like, blink, 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 blink. 
Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so because, and I think, you know, just one of those perfect storms where because it was also very short notice, they had me there for three days before they shipped me off to tour. Wow. They just gave me the liberty to create what I wanted to put forward for that piece. I'm like, sure. That's amazing. Yeah. yeah. So I initially came as a temporary replacement. And then on the basis of that, got offered the contract permanently afterwards. So just good luck, good timing. And, and honestly, a lot of people putting my name forward at the right time, mm. you know, because they were sitting there going, oh, my God, who who do we find? And about six people who knew the company and or knew the artistic director of the show at the time were like, hey, why don't you ask Tanya? So super thankful to all of those people because, yeah, it was it was really fun. Yeah, that's awesome. How long were you with Kidam? So I started the temp contract in 2011 and then wound up leaving the permanent contract at the end of 2013 because the company was doing some cutbacks uh, on that show, on, the, on, right. on every show at the time. Mm. And due to the, the vagaries of office politics, and how they chose to evaluate seniority. I'd asked for a rotation on the act and the, the offer to keep the role on a permanent basis was given to the person who had joined me on rotation. So, you know, it is what it is. Gotcha. And honestly, I... And rotation means that you swap out. That you does, swap out who yes. does the role. Yeah. So we were we were on off every three months, which was perfect because it gave me the time to to do other projects and to not feel like I was on tour all the time. So that's the thing. It's like I can... I don't know that I'm even, I, I would have loved to stick with that because it was just, it was a dream job. Obviously it's like doing that act is so amazing, but I'd gotten the chance to do it. I'd asked for a rotation because I didn't want it to be my whole life. So in the end, it's like, it's fine. I'll, I'll go back to the other projects that are keeping me alive. And, mm. and, you know, I have plenty of industry contacts. So yeah, there were parts about it that were disappointing, but then your career goes on. You have this very, I want to say like reasoned or very uh, rational perspective on the circus industry. I think that's really unique. We kind of talked about this earlier about like making non-circus friends and kind of like having those like lifestyle boundaries, which I don't know if I see a lot, especially in artists in Montreal. There's a lot of like all or nothing yeah. mentality. Well, and, and I... I think some of that is like you were saying, like when when people have been doing this from a younger age and have been invested in in this industry from that younger age, it's like it's it's your world. I came to circus quite a bit later, or at least invested in it full time a lot later. And the other fun part about it is that I, I went to university first. So, I mean, that was really a lot of my formative experience of being like, okay, here's, here's who I want to be as somebody taking care of myself as, you know, quasi, <laughs> quasi adult. <laughs> yeah. Totally. Um, and what I was getting my degree in was engineering, right. which is like the most practical yeah. thing in the world, you know? So it was, it was a shift for me to get out of that a little bit and to realize that there, there is a bit of the crazy that is okay and normal in this industry, but also like, I know it's not what I need to do. It doesn't have to be mm. all of what I surround myself with. And that, I think that made it quite easy to, at times when I needed to step back and be like, whoa, look, this is, this is not everything. This isn't all of you. And yeah, yeah keep in touch with people who don't do this. Yeah. For some perspective. So valuable. Do you think your engineering has informed your career at all? It certainly kept me safe sometimes. <laughs> uh, paid real good attention in that rigging class. Always, always look up before you go up. There's been times when that's come in handy. And, and I think a, a combination of that degree and, like I said, those, those first coaches in gymnastics who are like, watch other people and understand how this works before you go and you try it yourself. I went into engineering for a reason. I kind of really liked that mathematical and scientific approach to things. And I think analysis was something that I just carried forward with me into circus. So looking looking at how things work and why they work and why is this technique working. Yeah, I mean, a lot of engineers in circus actually are like who have that brain of like, 
how do we break this down? What are the elements? What is working about this? What's not working? It's, yeah. It's funny because it seems like they're two very disparate fields, but actually... But that's, I mean, that's the thing. It's, I mean, it's all Newtonian mechanics, you know? Like, it's very simple. No, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Go on. It's like, you know... What do those safety bats always say? Any activity involving motion, rotation, or height carries the risk of serious injury. It's it's momentum, it's inertia, torque, mm, leverage. Mm. How how your body works is all mechanics. Your muscles right. do certain things because you connect them in a certain order and have them firing in the right patterns or, like, cue your body the right way. So... You know, there there are some people who have a lot of, like, intuitive body sense. They learn skills by just putting their bodies through it, and somehow it miraculously works. Yeah, fuck those people. <laughs> <laughs> well, and it, it works easier for those little circus nuggets. The girls, I always, like, this was my, my thing in circus school, was, like, the red pandas. <laughs> Like, the tiny, little, adorable circus girls who are, like, they're so cute. You can't even resent that. You're just like, that is adorable. That's not me. And if you if you are taller or bigger, you're sometimes just at a mechanical disadvantage when you're learning skills. So, again, if you're not doing things in the right order and your body isn't processing what order those things should be coming in intuitively, it's really handy to have somebody there who will be like, you are pulling too early. Just wait another second. Yeah, sure. Yeah. So I, I think, yeah, it just kind of was a lucky coincidence that that was, that was where my, my brain was directed to go even while I was still invested in, in acrobatics from a different discipline. One of the things I remember reaching out to you because you had posted this thing about how long you were in the studio doing research versus people who take choreography off of, say, the internet and learn it for themselves. And I'm, I'm interested in your perspective on it or like to give a platform to talk about it a little bit more because I think it's like an interesting intersection we're at where people are finding inspiration, but it's not actually inspiration, it's just kind of copying. Yeah. And, and it's, the thing is, it's so nuanced and there, there are people who that's what they do is that they put content on the internet for other people to, to take what they want from it and everything. It's just, it's gone through such an interesting transformation because that did not used to be how the industry worked. Well, I mean, A, the industry used to really just be professional performers and those working to be professional performers. And so, like, there's this probably, you know, recreational slash semi-recreational population that now outnumbers the professional industry, would be my guess. Yeah, no, um, totally. And, of course, it's, it's completely changed the face of things. But what's good for people who don't necessarily know what it used to be like or that the professional industry does have different standards than the recreational community. So... Can you talk about those standards? Yeah. Yeah. So that's that's the thing. For professionals, there there is just this idea that if you've put time and effort into creating something unique in order for it to have an artistic and monetary value on stage, it's good for people to respect that for a year or two and leave that work to you so that you can benefit from the investment that you put in be it financial, emotional, physical, it's usually a combination yeah, of all three. Yeah, all the above, yeah. Because if other people start doing it right away, then you you lose the ability to gain contracts, to gain performances, to earn a living and pay your bills on the basis of having something unique that no one else is doing. So that just used to be how how everyone did things, especially because there there was no internet out there in order to look at what other people were doing. Right. Yeah, and to steal choreography, you would have to, like, go to their go, show. Yeah, and, like, try and be there with, like, a, you know, like some sort of, like, camcorder. Because yeah. yeah. <laughs> this was, like, pre-iPhone. Yeah, so the idea was that if, if you wanted to take something that someone else had created, you really did need to substantially change how it looked in order for it to, like, basically you needed to put in a, a comparable amount of work, physically, money, pain-wise, 
to to transform that move and to have it be something that really came from your work rather than theirs. Yeah. And that's the thing is that like what I hear a lot is from people in the recreational community, oh, but like I don't even perform, what am I taking away from those people? And the reality now is that there are so many people that go into the professional circus world or into semi-professional performance from that recreational community. And they're going to take with them the standards that exist. Oh, that's such a good point. In that community. Yeah. So that's the thing. It's like, if if there were no crossover, that'd be fine. But if somebody with 10,000 followers copies a professional's choreography, and what they normally do is put out their choreography for other people to copy, it's going to spread like wildfire. And what takes hundreds of hours of research may take only one hour to copy once you have, you know, an Instagram app that will slow down a video to like one tenth of its speed and let you like move forwards and backwards to understand what's going on on a technical level. So that's the thing. There's, there's no substitute for actually doing the research and creating that unique movement. But what we have is a, just a lot of porosity between these two communities right now. And that means that some of the young professionals that are coming up don't realize that the the standards for the professional community are still more or less the same, that we try to ask people to respect unique work that they see, at least until that artist is established and we can see that they're working regularly. Yeah. That's kind of what I was wondering about is the influence it's having on, because I was talking to Frey about this last week, the influence that social media or that culture is having on people who are at the school now who have access to Instagram and are like, do they still perceive those professional standards the same way? I think they, they, they do Mm. particularly because, but that's the thing. It's those kids are in there for three years to do what? To do research, to try to create their own work and to try and monetize that into value on stage. But that's why some of them don't post a lot of their training videos because they realize if I post this, there's a lot of people who now think that that becomes the public domain, that it's it's open to take, it's open for other people to take and to go out and try and do performance work with. One of the things I think people very often don't realize when they're when they are looking at like, you know, circus school students or recent graduate, like those circus school students, they're not allowed to leave and just take contract work. They're not even allowed to go audition for companies unless they have the school's approval. And if they leave a year, a year and a half, two years into that program, it carries a huge penalty from the school and you lose a lot of the resources and goodwill that you've built up there. Like they don't just get to leave and be like, I'm going to, I'm going to go ahead and, and perform now. And then I'll come back in eight weeks. It's, it's a huge commitment that they're making to try to have a future as a professional. So like they don't have contacts yet necessarily. They don't have contracts lined up just because they're at that school. It depends where the gaps are in the industry on any given year, who's making shows, who's looking for replacements. So they're going to some of the best schools in the world, people at like, you know, NICA or, you know, the the London Circus School or whatever. But that doesn't mean that they're not going to struggle to get work and particularly to make a full-time career out of performing. Yeah. So that's why they're trying to make all of this unique material so that they can offer something that no one else is offering. And if they come out into the job market and find out that everyone took their junk eight months ago or a year ago and already started putting it out there, it's not unique anymore. So that's that's the thing. It's particularly for younger artists. That's why it can be problematic. That and hi, I'm going to get up on my soapbox for like, let's let's try and keep it down to like two minutes. All right. (laughs) Um, And I I do this because I can and because the people who need to say it often don't feel like they can get given a fair hearing or like they get labeled as problematic for saying it. So like me, for example, I don't have a problem with people taking my, my technique or my tricks. Why? Because I am kind of, in a lot of ways, the prototype of what people want to see in the air. I'm white. I'm a girl. I've got really long legs. I do a lot of splits. That's pretty much the poster child for aerial silks. It's how I auditioned for the school. I was like, you hire people to look like I do, but I'm not short. I'm always going to look like this. 
This is still a super, 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 super privileged industry. That means we are not seeing as many minorities represented on stage. We're not seeing marginalized peoples represented on stage. And so particularly for them, it is a tough job market. There are so many people out there who will look at a black performer and be like, oh, but like we'd have to make a role for you on stage or oh, but you know, like when we had somebody in mind to be a juggler, like your default for that, you think juggler and you think a guy. And so some of the best jugglers in this city who are female struggle to get regular performance work and mm. don't get looked at for larger, more stable touring shows because it just wasn't the director's default idea of who that character would be in a show. So those people struggle a lot and they feel like they have to present something unique because so many people look at them and still aren't like, oh yeah, you are just a human being on stage, you know? And not in the sense, like they're, they're never going to be able to leave that behind. They will always think of themselves as a minority on stage. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. But that doesn't mean that they should have to be limited to roles where that's somehow fetishized or made a thing out of. But it is. So those performers particularly try to bring something that no one else is bringing in order to offset that. It's like, oh, if you're going to look at me like I'm different, I need to live up to that. They can you give an example? Do you mind? No. So, I mean, like one of the good examples, my, my best friend, uh, Joe Pinzon, who is a Filipino man yeah. who does aerial silks. Beautiful aerial yeah. silks artist. Yeah. Got told so many times, oh, yeah, but, like, we can't put a guy in that role. Like, we had that in mind to be a woman or, like, had performances where, you know, he, he was literally put on stage and, like, kind of made to, like, act out every Asian stereotype known to man because, like, it couldn't just be. And it's not it's not wholesale. Of course, there are times when those performers are, are just given a platform to express themselves but the opportunities are, are fewer and further between. And so those performers suffer more by having their unique material copied. Mm. Yeah. So there's a, there's a reason why those performers tend to be way more proprietary about their research and about their material. It's because they're already fighting the industry right. to get doors opened. You know, I was never going to have that happen because I, I, I look like You're what a people prototype. Yeah. yeah, I look like what people expect to see doing the disciplines that I do. And so I take the opportunity when I can to talk to people to be like, have you thought about what it would be like to be that performer and and to get told you're not getting a role because you're a woman doing German wheel and like that's just not what that role is or because we just didn't really see, mm, could you lose like 15 pounds? It's stuff like that where, where people feel like they have to set a different bar. And so I, I think it's particularly important if you see something new and particularly if it comes from a visible minority, someone who's trans in the community or very different presenting from standard, anyone with an unusual body type, if they haven't stated clearly that this material is being put out there so that other people can have access to their research, just write to them. That's, that's why the internet exists. We're all connected. If you see someone's video, that means you can probably direct message them yep. and be like, yeah. hey, I love this. Do you mind if I use this for some of my work or if I teach it to my students? Because if they, if they say yes, I mean, go for broke, you know? If they do have a problem with it, just contemplate why that might be. It's a great answer. Yeah. I went way over on my soapbox time. Sorry. No, 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 no. That's totally fine. I was here for all of it. I'm just mad at the weed whacker, whoever the fuck is outside, interrupting your soapbox time. The neighborhood is sabotaging me. <laughs> I'm interested to know, we're talking about that professional level, and I think the other part of that is, like, the technical aspect, the technical level that people reach. And I guess I'm interested, because this is something that I'm kind of questioning myself right now, is there a technical level you feel like people have to reach before they start doing that artistic research? No, that's the thing. I mean, even, even if you're a recreational student, 
there is so much that you can get back from using using circus or using aerial or whatever your discipline is, using that as a tool to research your own emotions or to connect with something that you might want to say, or you can do that work and participate in a student workshop. It's totally fine. It's important to understand your own limitations and to explore carefully if you are not sure where you are going. But Mm. I I don't think that it's limited. One of the things that I like to do sometimes if I'm giving workshops and if they're more spread out, if it's condensed, it's hard, but is to like give people two skills in a workshop and have them pair up on a, a whole bunch of the apparatuses and say like, take 15 minutes with your partner and find me a transition between these two skills. It can be short, it can be longer. Try not to peek at what everyone else is doing, or if you're really stuck, peek, but then try to go somewhere else mm. and just try try to find me a way to link these two that feels safe and creative to you. If you need a hand, if you need a spot, come around, I'm here. And then at the end of that 15 minutes, just go around and and have everybody look at the possibilities that have come up so that they understand like, like technique is a, is, a, is a toolbox. It absolutely is a means and not an end point to the idea of being able to express something with circus. That said, it's, a, it's very important to have tools. If you're only working with a hammer, <laughs> there's only so much you can accomplish. Sure. Makes sense. Going on a completely different tangent, I suppose. <laughs> but is there anything that you want to make or yourself because I know you're involved in short round production which is Joe's company touring mm-hmm. filament you're doing a lot of that kind of work are there any of your own projects or other like dream things that you're coming up with that you want to talk about no <laughs> <laughs> it's a very no. short answer Easy. Um, no. it's my fault I shouldn't have asked yes or no questions no 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 I will elaborate the short answer is no the the long answer is it's not where my strengths lie I love doing artistic coordination and being like an assistant director and project coordinator because those four years of engineering are really hard to knock out of your brain. (laughs) It is beautiful to have someone who will dream up really big, crazy, stupid ideas. And then to have someone like me as act, act as a foil to say, cool, here's the time that you have. Here's the money that you have. Here's the infrastructure that you have. Ah. Here's how we get the closest to your crazy idea that we possibly can. Boom. Let's go. I've made the schedules. It is less good to have somebody like me come up with a really practical mid-level idea because you don't have the crazy thoughts in the first place because your brain automatically shuts them down. There are so many really amazing creative people in this industry And I think I work better facilitating their ideas than I do trying to come up with my own. I think it's a way more useful niche. So that's, that's the thing. Uh, It's not, I never have ideas of my own. It's, I will happily foist ideas off onto other people and see if they want to run with them. But I'd much rather do that work of helping support other people because they're going to dream bigger than I would in the first place. Wow. That's some self-knowledge right there. (laughs) Dude, if someone, and I'm sure people do, come up to you all the time and are like, I want to be a professional aerialist, what should I do? What do you tell them? It depends where they're at and where they want to go with that. I mean, that's the thing. These days, that that can mean a lot of different things. Like I said, I, I knew I needed to go to circus school because I had zero stage experience. There are people who don't need to go to a full-time professional performing arts program in order to do that because they're already close enough. And what they really need to do is network and put together a full-length demo and send it off, you know? How does circus school, I'm sorry to interrupt, how does circus school help you with stage experience? You take two years of physical theater classes. Okay. You take dance class. You do presentations in front of people who are way more judgmental than a general audience (laughs) will be. You do participate in the end of your shows. Mm -hmm. You are immersed in an environment where you get to go and see other people. My first year, my class was very lucky. that So the Seven Fingers were just premiering Loft in Tohu. And we got to do like a... 
I don't even know what you would call it. Basically, they borrowed they borrowed seven of us to to be body doubles for five minutes of the show. And at a certain point after they were all off stage, seven people from my class came on as the seven fingers in like the iconic white underwear just to see how long the audience could be fooled, which was a very funny experience. So we all, you know, did, you know, a whole bunch of exercises with the fingers. And then they were looking at, I got chosen to be Isabel Chasse's stunt double, hmm. which was really funny because I'm about seven inches taller than her. Mm-hmm. But we have a lot of the same physiology and a lot of the same mannerisms. And my hair was long at the time. So we just made sure that it matched. And we kept me very far away from the other six <laughs> faux fingers because that would have given the game away. Yeah. So it was very, every time we went out on stage, you could hear people who knew them start laughing. But the general audience could take quite a, a bit of time to, to clue in. But like getting to work with them in my first year was actually really amazing. Like you, you get to see other performers hands on. There are a lot of the substitute teachers that come into the school, you know? So yeah, nice. yeah it, it was just that aspect of saying, like, I had no idea about, you know, performing. So having to do voice classes and mm-hmm. creation weeks where you would present stuff at the end of a week and, you know, presenting your act and taking physical theater and mask classes and all of that stuff was really necessary because I had no idea how to do anything other than look invisible as a university student. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Not so great on stage. Not so great on stage. Gotcha. Yeah. All right, cool. Sorry to interrupt. Um, All good. Your advice for, because I just get asked this all the time and I'm sure you do too. So I want to Save us some breath. No, but that's, I mean, like, truthfully, like, if people are like, I want to work for Cirque du Soleil, I'm like, cool. What is your best option? What act do you want to do? If you know the act that you want to do, go find it on the internet because it exists. Film yourself doing that specific act. All of it. All of it. Start to finish. Uncut. Demonstrate that you can do the skills. Send in a demo video of that with whatever else you can do. Like, they're going to be hiring for something very specific, you know? If you want to work for German Cabaret, it's it's knowing what the dimensions are, knowing that you need to be able to show them full uncut single frame camera of what your act is. And then also that you need to go and you need to meet those those casting people and go to the cabarets in person and usually go and audition your act there live. You know, like it, there's a whole range of what's out there. So what kind of circus artist you want to be has everything to do with the kind of advice that you get given, you know? And and if really what you want to do is stay in your local community and give back to that community and make art there, like, yeah, most of the time I'm like, you don't, you don't need to go to circus school for that. And, and yeah. that's, a, that's a very different and an equally valid response. Like those, those programs, those studios are giving back so much and they're helping to foster future generations of artists and people who are invested in the arts so that's always been my theory too is yeah. that you know even if your ambition is not to be on an international stage that doesn't mean you can't what you're doing isn't helping the whole community by spreading awareness and knowledge yeah you know it's like not every girl who goes to ballet class becomes a prima ballerina from new york city ballet but yeah a lot of those people grow up and fund dance yeah or go out and see dance yeah and give opportunities to smaller companies to present works on stage and years ago I did the the level one training for gymnastics BC because I I think anyone who's coaching go and go and take like the level <laughs> go, and, go, and take the, this, no, go and take the <laughs> level one training of whatever gymnastics is available in in your area that's such good advice there's there's just so many more years of data in those communities about what works and what doesn't and the programs are way more established and so it's not the solution but it is certainly very very useful but um, bc gymnastics and uh, gymnastics canada have a really amazing program in that they've looked specifically at this and gone look 99.99999 percent of the people that participate in gymnastics aren't going to be olympians and if you're an olympian you've got a gold medal for the rest of your life but that's still it. It's it's not it's not like you do that until you're you're eighty. It's not a career. And so what they really concentrate on is making sure that the people who participate in their sport have a good relationship with sport, 
a good relationship with fitness and that it contributes to them being happier and healthier people. Hmm. And a lot of the, the early training is really focused on that, building lesson plans, knowing how not to spot people. So knowing how to, how to use your big words and how to explain things to people before you, you risk putting them up in the air or, you know, or stuff like that. So I, I encourage that if you have somebody participating in circus and walking away healthier and happier, that should be the end goal. It doesn't mean that everybody has to be, you know, touring the world, totally performing on stage. Totally. Dope. All right. Last question. And then I'm going to go outside and shoot this. <laughs> But what's even better is that it was it was it was like a weed whacker before and now it's something completely different. I know. Different. It's, it's like <laughs> <laughs> And it only happens when I'm trying to give interviews too. It's like it's, it's usually nice and quiet on this little side street, but today <laughs> um what advice would you give to yourself at the beginning of your career? Don't be afraid to reach out to people and ask for what you want. A lot of times what what opportunities are missed is when you don't follow up on a conversation uh. that you were having with somebody. You send your material off to casting, but then don't do a follow up email to be like, hey, you know, any feedback or, you know, you were you were talking with a company that might offer you a contract, but you haven't heard back from them in a while. And you go, oh, but if they wanted me, then they would write. No, maybe they just forgot. Maybe they're really busy not being too hesitant about going after those conversations and pursuing them if it's something that you are you're really yeah, what passionate is that? about. It's like I I used to always be afraid that I was rude or that I was like intruding because like I sent my stuff and I didn't want to be pushy. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And and the thing is like of course it is it is possible to be pushy. It takes more than than you realize and I think particularly <laughs> it ta- it takes more than women realize. We're very much conditioned in society still that we're not supposed to be overbearing. We're not supposed Mm -hmm. to be too pushy or too aggressive. But a lot of times I think that means people miss opportunities and women miss opportunities for not wanting to come off as too aggressive. Whereas the reality is you're going to get told no tons and tons of times in this industry. And it's usually not a personal judgment if someone thinks you're not at the technical level or artistically, you're not what they're looking for, that's totally fine. But you can solicit that feedback and be like, ah, cool. Not at the technical level. All right. That's fine. But a lot of times when people say maybe it means, okay, like what else, what else can I do to convince you to make it a yes? You know, Mm -hmm. like put yourself out there instead of waiting to hear from people or waiting to see what opportunities are are going to come knocking. Knock yourself. Knock yourself. Yeah. Love it. Cool. Thanks, Tanya. Yeah. She just gave two thumbs up. (laughs) (laughs) That was my interview with Tanya Burka. Like I said at the beginning, there is so much in this interview and there's so much to reflect on, to think about, to take into your own practice. And as I do these little kind of wrap ups at the end, I sat there and went through my notes and realized I could go all over the place with kind of expanding on some of what I heard in this interview. Where I want to go, and the reason I initially reached out to Tanya for this interview, aside from the fact that she was always on my list when I first sat down and started to think about making a podcast and who I would want to interview, Tanya was like one of the first people. She's someone who's had an amazing career, can speak really eloquently, obviously, about her career and about the industry. And I always knew I wanted her on, but what inspired me to reach out to her was a post she made a while ago that was about how long it took for someone to create some choreography on aerial silks. And even though it takes so long to create, it takes just seconds to copy. And this is a really interesting place I think we're at in specifically aerial arts and social media. This conversation that has been ongoing, and I kind of want to put another spin on, that this conversation that's been ongoing in the community 
And it's that people have access to everything now. And it's great. People go from the world of recreational aerialist or kind of, you know, if you're the weekend warriors, the people who want to use this as your form of exercise, as your form of expression. I think that's amazing. And we can talk to each other. You know, these recreational aerialists can talk to these professional aerialists, can share ideas and mix in concepts. But there are standards that exist. And to be an informed viewer or informed practitioner of this art is to also understand these concepts. What takes hundreds of hours to create and then put on the internet only takes an hour to copy and then repost. So because of that, we have to start finding ways of respecting each other's art. Even if you don't want to be a professional or don't ever want to perform, if you're putting something out on social media, you're putting it into the world. And how you claim to have come across that or the wording you use and the interpretation you have, even in your own practice, is going to set some standards, especially if you have a ton of viewers. An important thing that Tanya brought up was this whole idea of people thinking, oh, just because I'm not a professional aerialist, you know, it doesn't matter because I'm not taking any jobs from anyone or anything. But the thing is, is that just because you go to the National Circus School in Montreal or one of these big professional schools, it doesn't assure you a job coming out of it as a circus artist. Just as much as, you know, I went to NYU and I didn't automatically have a job coming out as an actor. If you go to Juilliard, you don't automatically have a job in a symphony. It helps. I'm not going to pretend it doesn't, but you're still on the market. You're trying to get your work out there. And as a result, you have to be very careful about what you put out on social media. And it makes me really sad that people can't show works in progress or can't or are very careful and hold on to those things closely because they're afraid that other people won't respect their process. Even though I think of all the art forms, well, maybe not all of them, but circus is one of those art forms that takes so much time. And when you only see the finished product, you can't appreciate as much of what went into it as if someone were to share it over time. So it's that weird tension of, okay, I want to share what I'm working on, but at the same time, I don't want anyone to take it. And that comes from cultivating a community online of respect and an understanding of the stakes that go into creating some of this work. This whole discussion makes me think of this cartoon that was on MTV called Daria. If you're <laughs> of a certain age and a certain, like, aesthetic bent, you will have loved Daria. And Daria had this best friend, her name was Jane. And Jane was a painter. And she got a job that was replicating famous paintings. So her job was then to replicate a bunch of Van Goghs and Monets and all this stuff in their styles. And she did it all the time. And as a result, she neglected her own painting and started getting really burned out and really didn't understand why she was doing what she was doing and, you know, hated painting after a while. And I think the same thing can kind of happen to aerialists who only copy or who only go to Instagram and start looking and being like, oh, what's the next cool trick? What's the next cool thing I can do? Because you're not doing your own creative research. This podcast and this whole company that I'm building is the artist athlete. It's not just about athletics. It's not just about going on and seeing what the next thing is and how you can copy it. It's about your own projections into the world. It's about what you want to make. And you can't do that if you're just copying off social media all the time. That was a really long rant, and a lot of it wasn't from this interview, but just my own thoughts. So... Sorry, Tanya, I didn't mean to put words in your mouth. But I think what she started to say, and then when you take that a step further into minorities, when you take that a step further into people who are exploring disciplines that are not traditionally of their gender or of their race or of their culture, for example, female jugglers is a really good example. If you have people like that posting their research and then someone I keep wanting to say steal. I don't think people are intentionally stealing. But if you're doing those kinds of practices where you're looking online for inspiration and then taking that, it becomes problematic for that person's work that's already so difficult to get. And Tanya expressed that very eloquently. But luckily, as Tanya says in this interview, 
No matter what level you're at, even if you're just learning a footnot on aerial silks, you can still do artistic research. That ability to explore is still there. And if you have coaches and teachers who want to cultivate that, I highly encourage it. It's a great outlet and it really emphasizes this part of circus that is so beautiful, which is the individual and the creating that you can do and what comes from your originality and your intelligence. And we want to see that online too. So I'm going to end my (laughs) <laughs> reflections slash really long rant there. If you want to find Tanya Burka, you can find her online. Instagram is probably the best. She's got a lot of great pictures of her cats. She is at the Tanya Burka. Again, the Tanya Burka. You can find Tanya there. She's an amazing resource. She's also all over Facebook, Tanya Burka. For aerial tips, tricks, and information, you can find me on Instagram at the underscore artist underscore athlete. On Facebook, I'm the artist athlete. And the Facebook page specifically for this podcast is Friends of the Artist Athlete. But I'm much more active on the Patreon, which is patreon.com slash the artist athlete. And my website is theartistathlete.com. Thanks for tuning in, friends, fans, and enemies. I really enjoyed this episode. Would love to hear your feedback about it. And I will talk at you next week. The Artist Athlete Podcast is supported solely by donations from people like you. Here's what some of those people have to say. Aloha, my name is Beth Russell, and I live on the beautiful island of Maui, Hawaii. I am an aerial artist and movement instructor specializing in chakra yoga to keep me balanced and grounded. I play with silks, trapeze, lira, rope, acro, aerial yoga and dance, slacklining, pole, bungee, and climbing. Really anything that goes up and allows me to explore 3D space. You can find my dedicated aerial page on Instagram at Maui Aerialist. If you find yourself coming to Maui, let's play. Hey there, friends, fans, and enemies. This is Chris Alston, Patreon of the Artist Athlete Podcast. Straps artist and Lyra performer and acrobat out of Greenville, South Carolina. So if you're ever passing through, make sure to stop in and see me and my friends. We have a wonderful space and we'd love to see you. Hi, my name is Erica Lee. I'm from St. Louis, Missouri, and I'm an aerialist. I teach performing arts to elementary school during the day and do pole and slings and rope by night. I really, really like the Artist Athlete podcast because it gives me a lot of circus goals to look forward to. It gives me a lot of insight on what's going on around the world in circus. And um, that's why I'm Patreon. Hello, all. Thank you for tuning in to the Artist Athlete podcast. I am Opal Schwartz from Minneapolis, Minnesota. If you're ever in the cities, feel free to stop by the Aviary Minneapolis. It's a great time. With that, I hope you all have a wonderful rest of your week and goodbye.